Hello and welcome to this virtual production vlog. Today we're going to be talking about some of my studio upgrades that I've made. We'll talk about the green screen that I got, what the brand is, how much it costs, how you set it up. I really recommend this one. Uh, we'll talk about my lighting for the green screen, very important. We'll talk about the gear, the techniques, and we'll wrap it up by talking about the base stations for the HTC Vive for vir virtual camera, for simulcam, for live keying. Uh, I have more base stations. They're set up a little bit differently, so we'll talk about that as well. So to start, I upgraded my green screen and I got a Last Alight panoramic chroma key green screen. It's about $500 US and it is really easy to set up and I really recommend it. I have used a lot of different green screens from like very, very professional ones uh, on set to the full lowest consumer ones you can get. And this one's right in the middle. So if you can afford 500 for a green screen, this one's really nice. Let me take you through the setup process. It basically comes in a bag, which is really great, so it's easy to travel with. And you have these three, I, couldn't, I can't make three with my fingers. We have three frames here, one big one for the center and then two ones for the side. Uh, they're pretty easy to snap together. They have strings that keep them all together here, so you don't have to figure out which one goes where. You just snap them together, taking them apart, same process. Once the frames are put together, they come with four clamps. I did the four this way now. And they clamp together with little screws. Really straightforward, it's like a big Tinker Toy set. And once the frames are tied together, the beauty of this is the textile, the green screen fabric. It's halfway in between the really expensive like foam kind and the really cheap thin muslin like, you know, bed sheet curtain kind of stuff. It's right in between, really good quality, nice and stretchy. And the perfect part is that it's sized perfectly to that frame. As you can imagine, stretches perfectly onto it. You don't have to pull too hard, it's not loose. And there's these little clamps that clamp onto the edges, even the bottom of the frame. No tools, super simple, snap, 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 snap. It's up there. I think if I jiggled it a little bit, we'd get rid of even those wrinkles, but those would key probably okay. It's a really nice system and the uh, piece at the bottom, there's a little skirt at the bottom to hide the transition when you transition to a floor. It's really well thought out. I can't believe there aren't more things like that. It's really good. And this one I believe is about eight feet tall. You can look it up on the website. So it just fits in my like nine foot ish drop ceiling house. Uh, ceiling, so really good. They make a version that's a little bit bigger and they they sell kits that are little pieces of fabric with the same clamps and it makes it so that you can seam them together. So I've seen people do like two up and two across for really big ones. And specifically for this one, if I bought the same kit again with the uh, little divider piece, I could have basically a 180 green screen that's eight feet tall. Really consumer would be like, what, like a thousand, $1,200. I might go for it so that we can do like big 180, you know, virtual camera shots. That would be kind of cool. But anyway, Last Alight panoramic green screen. I'll link to it in the uh, link below. Uh, for those of you who have been following for a while, I used to be a Manfrotto ambassador. I am no longer. This is not sponsored. I bought that jam on Amazon. So moving on to the lighting, I'm using two Aperture LS one halves, and those were from when I was an Aperture ambassador. But I still like them a whole lot. Uh, I'll show you a breakdown of how they're set up. Okay, so quick lighting lesson here. Uh, we are trying to evenly light this wall here. It's impossible, but we're gonna do the best we can. So we have two sources up here, the Aperture LS one half and another one. They're very thin LEDs, uh, really perfect for such a thing. We're using uh, scissor clamps for the drop ceiling and we hung them right up there. So that's the positioning and we're blending the two sources together, but we have a range, right? So over here, we're getting a focus. I'll just tell you it's a 6.3. Uh, we're moving more towards the middle. It's not gonna focus for me. Uh, we have an eight, there it goes. Uh, and then by the other side, it's hard to tell because I'm just walking on green, I know. It's about a 6.3. Uh, so uh, I'll try to show it here. When I go to the bottom, like the lower part of the psych, we get about a, we get about a 5.6. So we lose about a stop of light from like here to there, that's very common. So to recap, the LS one halves, they're really thin, very low footprint, which you want if you're hanging them in like kind of a low ceiling situation. You don't want lights that drop down like a two feet or something like that. You really want really thin ones. They're also kind of like psych lights, they're floodlights. They have very wide beam angles. They're not, you know, going through a lens or a softbox. Those are perfect for lighting backgrounds evenly like that. And they're on remotes, they're aperture, it's, it's a really good time. 
If you want to go for something a little bit cheaper, like you can't afford three lights, four lights, like I have a lot of LEDs in here from my time being a DP and being like a filmmaking YouTuber. I just have so many lights, I'm probably going to get even more now that I started this series again. If you don't have that, you want to just have like something simple. What I would say is get the talent right up against the green screen, like one foot, two foot from the green screen, it's going to be okay. Um, and light them with just one light. So you'll light the person and the green screen all at once. Keep the light like kind of further than you would think so that the fall off is a little bit um, more even. There's a lot to talk about with that subject. Um, you might get a little bit of a drop shadow in the background, but again, if you have like one LED or two, just just put the person right up against the green screen really close, closely, light the, the foreground and the background at the exact same time. In this case, I can completely control the lighting of the screen separately from the foreground. That's what you want for like really cinematic lighting, which we're going to be doing a lot of demos of. But to get started, uh, if you can get this going really good, if not, just use one light, talent and background. We're talking like indie here. If you want to get to like real lighting, you got, you need lights. You need lots of lights. Moving on to the VR camera tracking side of things, I have four base stations now. So I used to have two. And the difference is when you're doing like VR gaming or just virtual camera, right? Like not filming real people, just moving the virtual camera. It's fun, right? All you need is two base stations for a Pro Vive, Vive Pro, right? You put them, you, you picture the box that you're going to play in, the area, it's a square, and on opposite corners, you put your Vive base stations looking back towards each other, more or less. Uh, and that's going to work out in most cases, that's what I've been demoing so far. But as soon as you enter like virtual production where you're filming with a real camera, uh, and you're lighting things, you're lighting the green screen, all of a sudden two gets to be really challenging unless you design it perfectly. Uh, there's two things to consider. One is that the trackers need to always be able to see, or the base stations need to always be able to see the tracker or the controller, whatever. And you can imagine if you're filming, right, and there's only one of them, and all of a sudden you put a softbox up, right, you're filming real people, it's really easy for that big softbox to block one of the sensors. It's really easy. That's what was happening before with me. Um, so if you have one on each corner of the room and all of a sudden you have a light blocking this one, you still have a good chance of having two, if not three, see it. And uh, as we do more lighting setups, you'll see that like lights take up a lot of room and sometimes you put them close to the talent or near the camera and the camera goes under a light or something like that. It's very common. You're going to need more base stations to be able to get this thing seen by it. So I have four now. They're in opposite corners of the room. Uh, it depends on your lighting setup, it depends on how you think it's going to be, but that's something you need to look out for, is one, that it can see this, and two, it's not getting blocked um, by a light, by talent, by someone's body part, something like that. More base stations, more coverage, it's going to work out better. Uh, another thing with the base stations is the, with the lighting. Uh, the base stations don't like to have bright lights pointed at them. So, you know, movie sets, not always the best, um, we'll see how mine goes, but one thing that I did here is that if we think in layers like, you know, background, foreground, camera, right, like in, in this order, in the very far background here is my green screen. In front of that are my green screen lights, and in front of that are my base stations. And that's so that the, the, the lights lighting the green screen here don't shoot into the base station, right? So we put the base station in front of the lights. As you can kind of see there, I have some B-roll of it I'll cut to. Um, that's very important. It's something that uh, forced me to move all my base stations at once. I have to recalibrate them, etc. Uh, but that is the base station, things to think about for virtual production. So that basically wraps it up for the studio updates on the gear, the lights, the new base station set up here. Uh, two more tips I want to give you uh, are that one, you want an incident light meter, okay? So if you want an even green screen, you can frame up on the green screen and use a waveform. That's a good start, right? That's a good one. The next thing you want to do is learn how to use an incident light meter, especially if you're a DP and you're going to be DPing virtual production stuff on green. You want this, or your gaffer needs to have it. Someone needs to have it. Uh, and this is going to allow you to go meter different parts of the green screen, like here, here, here. This doesn't really work. I'm not actually against it, just kind of... It kind of looks like I'm doing it, but you need to make sure that it's even, and it will never actually be even, but if it's uneven, you need to know where it's not uneven and the best way to compromise it. Um, it's very general, it depends if you're using space lights and blah, 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 but like, in general, so for like this setup, the top's always gonna be brighter than the bottom. 
impossible to not have that happen. The lights are on the top, they fall off. But there's different ways of positioning them and techniques for blending where you can get like an even green screen and you know that you have a one stop fall off on the bottom, that's okay. But just measure it. Make sure you're not like two stops under, that you're not having a huge hot spot in the middle. Um, you don't always have the camera when you're doing lighting. In a lot of cases, you might think like, oh yeah, you just look through the camera. What if the camera's not there yet? What if the camera's busy? What if tracking's having an issue? You need to go fix your lighting. You've got your, everyone's got their time on set. Maybe you don't have the camera to do the lighting. Light meter, light meter, light meter. Go get a light meter. Let me know in the comments if you guys need a refresher on how to light green screens and use this thing. You don't have this and you're lighting green screens on a busy set. Bad news, super bad news. You want this. Okay, the second and last tip is you're gonna want one of these as well. It's like, oh, a tape measure, like, ooh, mind blown. But if you live in the US, this is a metric tape measure. Ooh, ooh, that's rough, right? That hurts. Well, in the computer, in Unreal Engine, in, in most civilized <laughs> things, um, it's metric because the math is straight garbagely gook, just garbage if you're using Imperial, it's really hard to do. If you're, you know, architectural software and construction in the US, of course that's all probably Imperial. Uh, but when, when stuff gets serious, like once you start getting into precision, even in an Imperial system, it's like all of a sudden it's millimeters, right? All of a sudden when it gets real precise, it's millimeters. Well, virtual production, it's precise. It's computers, Unreal Engine, all meters. So you want the distance from the talent to the camera plane for, for setting up uh, matching focus distance. Metric, there's no way you're gonna do that Imperial in Unreal Engine, it's just not the way. If you wanna measure the distance from the tracker to the film optical center, you better be giving that in centimeters. Uh, all the instructions that come for VR stuff, like base stations need to be no further than six meters apart, six meters apart. I'm actually been working in, in metric so long that I think of meters before I think of feet at least when it comes to this kind of stuff, almost instantly, I'm like, okay, how many meters, right? That we want to keep it like 20 centimeters. Like I really think that way from like Houdini, Unreal Engine, virtual production, it's all been meters for like the last like two years of my life. I never talk feet when it comes to regards with this. So um, I'm not saying focus polar all of a sudden, you know, switch to metric because that's probably impossible for you at this point. But uh, if you're at all, uh, if you're at all like malleable in your brain, you want to start co-learning meters really fast because everything on a virtual preset, on a virtual production set, everything is gonna be called out in meters and centimeters. So you might wanna start getting on that. Okay, so that wraps it up for this virtual production vlog. We didn't get to actually do any shooting, but this is enough of a mouthful of just the gear and some basic lighting techniques. And you know, virtual production for me is like this amazing match of like all of my like, you know, years of experience. That sounds kind of like self-congratulating to say that, but I spent 10 years as a cinematographer shooting a lot of green screens. And then I've spent the last like four or five being in 3D and the last two in Unreal Engine. And virtual production, you need both super hard. Like you could be an amazing Unreal Engine artist uh, or a programmer or whatever, like Savant, and you get onto a film set you don't know the first thing about what's going on. How do you light in the real world? There's a lot with cameras. There's a lot with everything and kind of vice versa. If you've been on film sets for a long time, but you've never touched Unreal Engine, you're in a hard place. So the virtual production is this kind of cool environment where like we need to really talk and understand to one another. The cinematographer and you know, whoever's the virtual gaffer or running the virtual set, they, you guys better be on the exact, or gals, be on the same exact page, n use the same words, both use centimeters, both use lux. You better be talking like the same language, making it work. So it's it's kind of like really cool to see these things just like collide into each other uh, and exist under one tentpole name, virtual production. And that's why I'm so excited. I'm like making YouTube videos again about it. Um, pretty cool, pretty exciting. So hopefully on the next vlog, um, I'm gonna get into some actual virtual production again, actual shooting stuff. Uh, it's, it got a lot more complicated now. I need talent now. I'm gonna be shooting it uh, and running Unreal Engine. I need talent. The demos get a little bit harder to do. Uh, this gets to be a little bit more involved, which is why I stopped making YouTube videos before is because it's, it's time consuming and honestly expensive to film this kind of stuff. Like overall, like I need to go get like an actor and you know, it, gets to, it gets to be a lot, but I'm down in this case. Like virtual production, it's, it's worth it for me. Like that, that works for my company, that works for my interests at the moment. So uh, I'm gonna keep pushing in this direction. And uh, things that I'm looking forward to are getting the Vive Tracker as good as it can be and showing that workflow to everyone that wants to get into it at an indie level. It will work with Cinetracer as well, at least the virtual camera part. Uh, I'll be looking to review and demo 
more expensive uh, camera tracking solutions. Uh, there's a Vanishing Point, uh, NCAM, Mosis, Star Tracker, uh, Stipe. Uh, there's, I think there's, a, I guess there's like a new NCAM system. There's an older one as well. Uh, those are a lot more expensive. The software, more or less, I think now just integrates into Unreal Engine. Sometimes it's its own standalone. Uh, and we'll check those out over time as well. And I'll be looking at some lighting things. There's some lighting things that are coming into this environment to control lights from Unreal Engine and have them be all synced together. Uh, and there's a lot of new stuff that's uh, been heading my way from Cinetracer and Unreal Engine that I'll be showing you as well as it relates to virtual production. So lots to do this year. Uh, RIP GDC, anyone watching this at this point who is planning on going, obviously it's it's canceled. So them, I am like legit sad about that. So, you know, all the meetups, obviously, obviously that's all canceled. Uh, so if we had meetings, we're obviously not, not gonna do them. Uh, but again, uh, make sure to check out the virtual production Facebook group. I run it, but there's a lot of Unreal Engine people there, a lot of like veterans in virtual production and also a lot of newbies as well. I consider myself a newbie in virtual production. Um, big group, no, it's not a big group. It's a small group of people, but it, it's growing. Uh, and if you wanna continue the conversation or share stories or ask questions, uh, to a group of people that literally like this is what we do and we're trying to make it work uh, come check out the Facebook group so that's it for this vlog and I'll check you guys on the next one